I thought I'm Anthony. I've just been a member of this group for a long time. This is the first time we've ever tried live streaming here. But this is a really interesting story. I've been watching the news and this has come up a couple of times. And I, I'm just thinking about the culture that we live in and how, I don't know, obviously very few people here are vegetarian and vegan as a percentage, although that percentage is going up and up. So this culture of saying, oh, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan and you raise your kids like that, you know, they're going to have all sorts of nutritional facilities. It's going to be bad for them when actually um, anyone who bothers to look at the stats is going to come across the fact that um, McGregor from nutritionfacts.com says that vegetarians and vegans are at a lower risk of 24 out of the 25 leading causes of death um, with the exception being accidents. Okay, so what I wanted to do is see if we can look at some of the claims of the British Nutritional Foundation and see how factual they are. Now, I'm not an expert, all I'm just a hobbyist. I've been researching this for a long time and I'm thinking in terms of, um, well, you know, all the caveats apply. This is not medical advice. Do your own research, etc., etc., etc. Right. I'm just talking. I'm just going to talk to you about what I understand to be the ideal diet, according to my research, and um, how that looks in light of the claims being made by the British the, uh, Nutritional Foundation. So let's look at this claim first. Vegetarian and vegan children need to eat three portions of protein a day. Parents told. Right. Now, this is interesting because it, a lot of people are eating far too much protein. And we've heard all sorts of risks and conditions that are related to eating too much protein. But they're not cautioning against this. this uh, the thing is, you, your body can actually make protein out of amino acids. Those are the building blocks of protein. So this total worry that, oh, you're not going to get protein is really fallacious as long as you're getting the amino acids you need from your food. So it's actually, it's been argued that it's much better to create your own protein for, in your own body from amino acids than to consume protein because, well, like when you consume that animal product, for example, what you're getting is that fully formed protein, like it's a wall that your body has to then tear down and then piece back together to make your own proteins. Whereas if you're getting the basic ingredients, the building blocks, which are the amino acids, then you're going to be able to make that wall yourself without having to clear all the cement from in between the blocks and tear it down and then build it up again. So when we, um, obviously there's some good stuff in there about sh uh, limiting sugary cereals, salty crisps and fruit juice, right? You don't need any processed sugar in a natural diet. So why don't they just tell all parents, stop having processed sugar? That stuff is inherently bad for you. Uh, if they were really concerned about people's health, they just say, cut out all the sugar, um, and they'd be telling the cereal companies to not put any sugar in their cereal at all. Salty crisps, of course, you know, delicious, mm, love it. Sorry, you don't actually need any salt in your diet either. It's going to suck water out of your cells and dehydrate you. Same goes for these, the kind of oils that they um, cook these crisps in. Now, I love a packet of crisps, but I'm under no illusion that it's something that's good for me. So if they're going to be serious, why don't they just say to all parents, not vegan parents, cut out the crisps. Fruit juice as well. The, now, when you have a piece of fruit, we're always told, oh, it's... Um, got too much sugar in it by vegan skeptics, by raw food skeptics. Oh, you can't eat all that fruit. It's got too much sugar in it. No, the fruit is full of water and it's full of fiber, which means that the sugar, the simple sugars, metabolize completely differently. Now, there is a risk with drinking fruit juice that you're going to get too much sugar, just like if you drink a soda or any of the other crap that we put in our bodies. Same goes for dried fruits. Not exactly 
ideal because you're taking out all that water, drying them out. It's full of sugar, it's going to stick to your teeth, and then bacteria is going to grow on your teeth and it's going to create, um, create potentially create problems, dental problems for you. So, you know, you do want to, you do want to limit that, but these things are not exclusive to vegetarian, vegan children. So what's with the targeting? Um, the, so this is what we're hearing here. Veg, vegan and vegetarian diets can be healthy for young children. Parents are advised to visit a GP to ask for advice about supplementation of key nutrients. Now, first of all, if you go and just do a quick Google, you'll find that doctors, GPs, are given almost no education in nutrition whatsoever in their area. And the Guardian even went out of their way to say that this was a massive uh, problem. So I don't know if GPs are the people to ask for advice about supplements and key nutrition, especially since they tend to be as I experienced myself when I went to speak to a GP about supplementing anything, very, very skeptical about taking nutritional supplements. Um, it can be difficult for young children, says this body, to get enough vitamin A and B12, riboflavin, iron, zinc, calcium, and iodine. Oh yeah, I'm sure you're gonna get it all from me. Right, I don't know the facts on most of these things, but I can tell you a little bit about B12. See when they test people who are vegetarian or vegan and meat eaters or people who consume animal products for B12 deficiency. What they find is the people who eat animal products are just as vitamin B12 deficient. The, the rate is about the same between the two groups. So, so why is that? Why is that? Because when they say that vegans and vegetarians have a low serum vitamin b12 that's what they say they've got low serum vitamin b12 what that actually means is they don't have very much b12 in their blood compared to who compared to the average the average is the average person most of whom are eating animal products now since b12 comes from bacteria it's made from bacteria there's no surprise as to why if you're eating animal products you're going to have more vitamin B12 in your blood, serum vitamin B12. But that's not really relevant. What you want to know is whether you have B12 in your cells or not, okay? And if you're eating a good diet, you've got tons of bacteria in your body that could produce vitamin B12 and hopefully get it into your cells. So that would explain why meat eaters have exactly the same level of vitamin B12 deficiency as vegans and vegetarians do. So these are just myths that people don't know because, uh, the truth about because they just get repeated over and over again. Where are you going to get your B12? Where are you going to get your B12? Actually, when you understand what's going on with the B12, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, we're being told how we need to balance our diets and use supplements. And this is all the idea, well, that, the, that, the, that a diet including meat is the natural diet for human beings. I don't think it is. I think that human beings are tropical animals. We evolved in the tropics. All our closest evolutionary ancestors uh, are, ha are vegetarian. We keep ourselves constantly in tropical conditions by wearing clothes if we're inside in a cold day we put the heating on, if it's too hot we put the air conditioning on. We're constantly trying to create a tropical environment around ourselves. I think that the ideal diet for a human being is raw, sorry, I'm not saying that I always eat raw food, but yes, I'm just talking about the ideal here, raw plant-based diet, mostly fruit, some soft leafy greens. Yeah, you can chuck some nuts and seeds in there, but they're hard to digest. So the, the, this idea that they're trying to push that the we're the ones that need to worry about our uh, deficiencies when it's all the meat eaters and all the people who are drinking too much milk who are getting fucking osteoporosis arthritis heart disease uh, cancer stroke diabetes etc etc why are they not advising those parents those parents who are feeding their children animal products feeding them milk which is mucus performing 
uh, mu mucus forming. This uh, company is, th this organization, British Nutritional Foundation, is describing milk as a good choice for drinks. Yeah, it's a really good choice for drinks if you want osteoporosis and cancer and if you want to get the flu and if you want to get diabetes and all sorts of other maladies, then yeah, milk's a really great choice. As for eight, children aged six to five years, including those who are breastfed, consuming less than 500 millimeters of formula a day, the BNF suggests parents give them supplements of vitamin A, C, and D. Why are they doing that? Why aren't they telling them what foods, what fruits and vegetables they can get um, vitamins A, C, and D? And by the way, when I say I think that human beings should eat mostly fruit, in that I include cucumbers, avocados, tomatoes, uh, bell peppers, except for green peppers, they're not ripe, they're not good for you. Those are fruits. They've got seeds inside them. They're fruits. They're kind of veggie fruits. They, they seem more like vegetables, but the, the fact that they've got a packet around them, they've got seeds inside them, makes them fruits. So I'm not, I, I, I think this idea, you know, of children under the age of two being advised to drink whole milk. No, they should drink be breast milk, but milk from a cow that's full of, ah, uh, the chemicals they feed these cows to fatten them up, all of that's going into the milk, and then you give them to your two-year-old child. That sounds ridiculous. All the antibiotics they pump those cows full of, all of that's going through their milk into your little baby. Why, why do people, why, why do the doctors not believe, um, talk about this? Well, because they, they don't want to believe it themselves. So the thing is, Milk, you know, dairy products, they're kind of addictive. You get oxytocin from having dairy products because they're um, designed to make that calf bond with the, with the mother. And that's why, you know, people can go without having cheese for ages when they're trying to go vegetarian or vegan. And then, you know, they go, oh, I'll just have, oh, I'll just treat myself and have a pizza. And then next thing they'll be having four or five pizzas that week. Hi to the people who are tuning in. I've not got any comments yet, but um, I've done a lot of the good stuff about B12 and so forth already. Okay, five portions of fruits and vegetables, three portions of dairy foods, three portions of dairy foods. Dairy is not good for you. Where do we get this idea that dairy is good for you? There is zero evidence that dairy is good for you. Zelch, right? Um, now, and again, five portions of fruits and vegetables, very vague which fruits, which vegetables, and how do you combine these? They, don't, they could tell people something useful, like see if you have an orange and a banana at the same time, you can't digest that. An orange needs one environment to digest uh, uh, because it's you, you know acidic, and a banana needs a completely different environment to digest. You should, there, there's, there's rules about what fruits you should combine, and these take maybe 45 minutes to digest, so it's good to have one, and let it fully digest before having a cooked meal or something like that, because all that's going to happen is you're going to put the heavy food in before or after eating a fruit. It's going to push the fruit to the side. It's going to ferment in your digestive tract, and you're not going to get any of the benefits of eating the fruit. So if you want to get the... What they should be telling people is if you really want to get the benefit out of eating fruit, if you want to fully digest your fruit and get all the nutrients have mono fruit meals, have just citrus fruits, or just bananas, or just apples, or just berries, or just watermelon, or just papaya, especially melons. Melons have to be eaten on them on their own. That's well known. You can Google this. Don't take anything I say for granted. I'm just sharing the knowledge that I've had over the years researching this to try and understand what what the right choices for me are and experimenting with my bodies and learning this stuff. One portion of pasta is stated as being the equivalent to two or to five tablespoons, according to experts, of, pro of protein. Or while a slice of bread is one portion and a portion of dairy is one. Look, this food is problematic. Pasta, bread. Your stools, sorry to talk shit, but your stools should be about 75% water, right? You have a slice of toast. How much water is in that slice of toast? Almost zero. Zelch, right? Why is the British Nutritional Foundation recommending this? This is going to dehydrate you. You're going to have to wick tons of water from your cells and 
all the places you need water to move the toast along your digestive tract. It's not going to, this is not going to promote long term health, okay? I'm not saying that you can't ha go out and have a vegan pizza every now and then or have, you know, a lovely slice of toast with whatever spreading. I'm just saying, recommending this as daily food. This is not food. This is not food. This is not good for you, okay? Right? When you're eating high water content foods like watermelon or cucumber, papaya, it's easier for you to rehydrate your body because the water is kept in little pockets of a small number of molecules, right? So that's easier for you to ingest than a glass of water. I'm, I'm not saying... Uh, uh, if your body's nice and clean and you, and you can take it in, right? I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink a glass of water when you're thirsty. Of course you should. All I'm saying is that high water content foods should be the mainstay of our diet if you don't want to get dehydrated. Just think of the difference between a watermelon or a cucumber, which is over 90% water, and pasta, which you have to rehydrate, of course, but, you know, how much of that, or, or worse, a slice of Toast, how much of that is water? This is why you just go out and look around people when you've when you've once you discovered this, and you'll see the dehydration all over everyone. It's because of the modern diet. Shocking. So yeah, these people are going and cooking meat. And how much water content do you think the meat has once it's cooked? About fifty percent, fifty-five percent. That's taking water out of your cells because your stool should be about seventy-five percent water. Okay, so I, I just, I lose my faith in humanity when I see the official authorities are completely clueless about what the human body actually needs to thrive. It's very, very frustrating. Why are they targeting vegan parents telling them to limit high sugar cereals and fizzy drinks? That should go for everyone, everyone. And I'm not sure about the vitamin content of fruit juices once they've been pasteurized. You know, when, when they pasteurize them, they're just basically killing off uh, everything that makes it alive and make everything that makes it useful to your body. Okay, so I'm, I'm, let me just look down the article a little more. They're talking about portion sizes. Look, most people, yeah, everyone's very in touch with their body and eats a diet that's mostly ideal, you get to the point where you know when something's good for you or not afterwards. Uh, I'm not all the way there. Uh, I'm on my way. I've done, um, you know, water fasting five and a half days the first time, 11 and a half days the second time. I'm looking forward to another week of water fasting coming up to clear out my system. And what I noticed was a much greater sensitivity to know what foods are good for me and what aren't because you're killing off the yeast, you're killing off the candida parasites that live in your digestive tract, and your good bacteria eats all that stuff up, it loves it. Your, your good bacteria is there to feed on dead and dying cells, so it's really great for restoring digestive ants along with other things. Cleaning out the body, becoming ready to digest the ideal diet, and that should be, as I say, high water content fruits and things that we think that are vegetables but are actually fruits. So, children should be physically active for at least three hours a day over the course of the day. Yep, I think that's, that's pretty good. That looks pretty good, pretty, pretty good. So, I want to go on to the other article. That one was from the Independent, this one's from the I. Vegan parents told to see their GPs for advice on supplements to keep children healthy. It's so paternalistic and patronizing. Like, I do want good information for parents on what to give their kids, but um, singling out vegans and vegetarians when we know that we're at the lowest risk of 24 out of the 25 leading causes of death is really, really frustrating. And maybe they should actually be warning parents not to get their children habituated to animal products, which are going to create health problems for them over the long term. Now, one in eight Britons are now vegetarian or vegan. Woohoo! Good news! That must be more than ever in a very, very, very long time. And um, 
let me just see. I just want to, I, I just don't, okay, I want to say this one more thing about the three portions of protein a day. On the ideal diet, and back in the day when this body was evolving, human beings would go for long periods of time without food. And that's really, really good because the digestive system takes 50% of our energy per day. And when it's not running, the body's got lots of energy and space to run around eating up stuff that it doesn't need, pissing and shitting it out, clearing it out through your nose, through your sweat, everything. Now what we're used to is snacking all day and our digestive system never turns on. People call this intermittent fasting when they go for 16 hours without food. That's not a fast, that's nature. The ideal for a human being over 30 years old is to have two meals within a six hour period. I'm not saying I always do it, I'm just saying that would be ideal. Why? Because then your digestive system is off for long periods of time, every 24 hours, and gets lots of time to hear, heal, rest, and repair your body and take out things that don't need. You'll notice that when you work really hard, when you really focus on something, you don't feel like eating. That's just natural. When our belly's not full, when our digestive system's not running, that's, that's um, very, very good for your concentration and other things. So, so this idea that you should be, right, okay, I said for a human being over 30 years old, two meals, six to eight hours apart, perfect. Okay, not saying I always do it, not saying you should always do it. You know, we need our little luxuries. Okay, treat yourself. For someone less than 30 years old, Three, three meals, probably. This is what they say, at least in the yogic system. And I think there's good evidence to back this up. So when people are coming along saying, oh, you should have five portions of this, five portions of that, three portions of that, not even talking about what foods combine, what foods your digestive system can process and handle at once and so forth. That's um, very frustrating to me especially when these are meant to be the experts and they're given this legitimate stamp. Now, one of the problems with diet is there's so much conflicting advice. I've changed my mind on so many things when it comes to diets, things that I thought were good, I no longer thought were good. For a while, I, I um, considered that people with dige different, dige different genetics might need different foods. Now, I think that people with genetics might cope with certain foods better, but the ideal diet for all humans is more or less the same. Um, obviously, I wasn't always, uh, uh, um, I, I used to eat animal products in the past and I thought that was good for you, then I made the switch, then I thought you needed more cooked food, then I thought you needed less cooked food. I'm open-minded, I don't have an ax to grind. My opinion keeps on changing the more information I've got. These are the best conclusions I've reached based on my years of research and experimenting on my own body and actually seeing certain conditions disappear. Like I had eczema, I had other skin um, conditions, especially my feet took the longest to clear out, but they cleared out, okay? So I've got hard evidence that a lot of the things that I'm saying work for me. I've noticed symptoms come up when I deviate from this diet for a long time, but I've also got a buffer. So I can go out and eat bad food for a couple of days and I don't get symptoms anymore because I've got a relatively clean body and I've been observing a relatively good diet for this time as well as using fasting as a tool to clear it quicker. So I've not got an ax to grind, I'm open to evidence. Why is there so much conflicting information? Why isn't there scientific consensus? I would say that's because we've got a healthcare system that makes money when people are sick right? So when you go to the doctor, he's getting paid for seeing you, you for that. When you get an operation, uh, when they sell you pills, um, you can, you know, if, if your hormones are off, you get sent to an endocrinologist, but that might cause another problem, which gets you sent to another specialist. All of the medications have side effects. Well, then they can give you medications to treat the side effects. I'm not saying that medical professionals are trying to harm people. Definitely not. They're trying to help people but the system has a certain incentive, which is the more they treat people, the more money they make, right? If I was a financial advisor, and I was to come to you and say, look, let me look after your money. See when your bank account goes down, I'll make more money, and when it goes up, I'll make less money. 
would you want to solicit me as your financial advisor? Well, if you had any sense, you'd say no. You'd say, I want a financial advisor who makes more money when I make more money and makes less money when I make less money. And that is the healthcare system of the future. But the healthcare system, the more healthy people are, the more money the healthcare system makes. The sicker they are, the less money the healthcare system makes. Then all of a sudden you'll start getting very, very good information on what's the ideal diet for everyone and how much exercise people should take and what's the ideal kinds of exercise for different body types or different stages or people who are at this level of illness. Now, when they make money from us being well instead of us being sick, then we'll start to see the good quality information coming out of these experts. Until then, beware of what these uh, so-called bona fide agencies have to say. Thank you.